Chapter Eight of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Eight. The heart is a small thing, but desireth great matters. It is not sufficient for a kite's dinner, yet the whole world is not sufficient for it. Hugo de Anima. That evening, Vere and I settled the business details of the developments he had planned. Also, while we three were quietly together, I launched a discussion that had been gathering in my mind all day while I watched Phillida. "'You are doing as efficient work as Vere, I told her. "'In fact, you are a most moderate pair. "'I gave you an open bank account, Phil.' and you have furnished the house for so little that I am amazed. And it is all so gay, so freshly pretty. Being an ignorant man, the details are beyond me. But one servant? Aren't you working yourself too hard? I had expected you to need several. Of course we are not counting Vere's outdoor force. She turned in her low chair beside the lamp, and glanced toward the window behind her, before replying. I noticed the action, because a moment before Vere had turned precisely the same way. "'It is good of you to think of those things, Cousin Roger,' she declared. "'But I want to be a real wife to Drawls. I do, indeed. And I have it all to learn, because I was not brought up for that. Look at this dish-towel I am having.' Christina would laugh at the stitches if she dared, yet they are better than when I began. Some day I shall sew fine things. So it is with all my housekeeping. I think we should begin as we mean to go on, so I have furnished the house for us. Perhaps if it had been for you alone, I should have chosen satin wood and tapestry instead of willow and cretonne. THE SAME WAY ABOUT CHRISTINA. IF ETHAN AND I ARE TO SAVE AND EARN THIS LOVELY PLACE, AS YOU OFFERED, WE CANNOT AFFORD MORE THAN ONE MAID. YOU UNDERSTAND WHAT I AM TRYING TO EXPLAIN, DON'T YOU? YES, I ASSENTED, SURELY. WHAT WERE YOU LOOKING FOR JUST NOW, BEHIND YOU? I? OH, NOTHING. I JUST FANCIED SOMEONE HAD PASSED BY THE WINDOW AND STARED IN. I can't imagine what made me fancy that, unless the cat... She hesitated. Bagheera is asleep under Mr. Locke's chair, Vere observed casually. Truly, Cousin Roger, I love the way we're living, she resumed. It is very miserable of me, I dare say, not to be more intellectual after all father and mother labored with me. But it is so. I want to live this way all my life, to be busy and plan things with Ethan and make them come true together. Under cover of the table she put her hand into Vere's, and silence held us a little while. I watched Bagheera, the cat, who sat beside my chair, staring with unblinking yellow eyes toward the window across the room. Did I imagine a slight uneasiness in those eyes? A wary readiness in gathered limbs and muscles, bulking under the old cat's scant fur? Now the tail twitched with a lashing movement. Presently Bagheera looked away and relaxed. A moment more and he curled down, composing himself to sleep. "'You like the place, Phil?' I questioned. "'You do not find it lonely here, or in any way depressing?' The candor of her surprise told me that no dweller between the worlds had visited her. "'Cousin Roger, this darling house? Why?' I passed that question safely, and after a few minutes bade them good night. They had a fashion of gazing at one another that made it a matter of necessary kindness to leave them alone together. As I made my solitary way upstairs, I will not deny a growing excitement, or that dread fought with my resolution. 
Who would keep tryst with me tonight? The horror or the lady? Both, as each time before? If so, which one would come first, and what might be my measure of success or failure? If some trick were being played upon me, I meant to pluck it out of the mystery. The quietly pleasant room received me without a hint of the unusual. I lighted the lamps and sat down to my work. The house was still by ten o'clock, all lights out except mine. At midnight I lay down in the dark, the pomander under my pillow. Whether I put the gold ball there from sentiment, or from some absurd fancy about its perfume and mystic carving being somehow a talisman against evil, or because I feared the trinket might be taken from me during the night, I should be troubled to answer. I did place it there, and lay lapped in its sweet odor while the moments dragged past. Heavy, slow-footed movements of strain and dreadful expectation scarcely relieved by a hope uneasy as fear. The cock crowed for the first hour and for the second. I slept at last. When I awoke, level sun rays were striking across the world. Nothing had happened. End of chapter 8 Recording by Roger Moline